Wednesday, June 29th, you all should be reading in 1 Kings chapter 8, Psalm 30, and 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, I love how this passage begins in 1 Kings, or, and we're reading through Solomon's rise, Solomon becoming the wisest king to ever live. It says this in chapter 8, Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite family. And we're going to find out as you go along, he also gets all, all the priests to come along and do things too. And, and I love this. Solomon is ready to do something magnificent for God. He's been building this temple, right, for seven years. He's been on this journey to have a place of worship for the God that's a permanent structure. We talked about this last week, that it wasn't a permanent structure before. It was just a tent that would tear, uh, put up, tear down, put up, tear down. He wanted a permanent place to bring glory and honor to God. And this is a cool thing. He learns from his father, David, of what not to do. Remember when David brought the uh, Ark of the Covenant in, in, in 2 Samuel to Jerusalem the first time on a cart, he didn't do what God told him to do, and God ended up striking a man dead. And then he did it the right way. Solomon learned that, hey, we got to do it the right way. We got to do it the way God tells us to do it, to move the cart or to move the ark the way God tells us to move it. So he did. He brought it into the temples, ready to celebrate all that God has done. Side note, parents and grandparents, sometimes we have awesome dreams for the kingdom of God that God has laid on our hearts, but we're the ones that aren't going to fulfill them. Sometimes what happens is we get to start the journey of faith. We get to start this dream for God that we have, and it gets passed along to our children and our grandchildren, and they get to see the fruit. They get to see uh, the labor done. They get to see the end of the toil. They get to see the product fulfilled. And I just want to encourage you, just because you have a dream that you can't fulfill in your lifetime doesn't mean that it's not the right dream. You should be dreaming about what you can do to help God's kingdom flourish so everybody everywhere has a chance to belong to the kingdom of God. And then you need to make sure you're teaching your kids and your grandkids to follow after Jesus with all their being too. Back to this passage though. It says this. This is something that threw me off as I was reading through this. In verse 5 it says, King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel, and that is the elders, the, uh, the chief priests, all, all them, they all came together. And they gathered around him and before the ark, and they started sacrificing so many sheep and cattle they could not be recorded or counted. Think of this picture. They built this brand new, beautiful temple with gold and marble and all these uh, cedar trees from Lebanon. And the first thing they did to dedicate it was sacrifice so many animals thousands upon thousands of sheep and cattle that they couldn't even count them that the, that the area around it was literally pooling with blood and we know this from other passages in the bible because when the feast would happen when god's people would gather for feasts they wouldn't have this amount of sheep and cattle they would have lesser than this and they said they talk about how the priest would walk through pools of blood the blood was everywhere because in the Old Testament, because of sin, because of people, blood had to atone for things. But what we find out in the book of Hebrews, if you actually fast forward to chapter 10, the author of the book of Hebrews says, actually, the blood of goats and of bulls, they actually don't do anything for sin. Which is why the people of God in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice sheep and cattle and all these things that God told them to, to atone for sin, but it wasn't a permanent solution. You know how bad a blood was in the Old Testament. It was a temporary solution to their sin problem, to our sin problem. Which is why what Jesus did for us, what Jesus did for us on Calvary, being the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, is so important. This passage gives us a glimpse of a beautiful thing being stained by blood because it was full of sin and corrupted people. And it wasn't good enough. Uh, we'll see later, we'll talk about this tomorrow a little bit, that God actually ends up dwelling in that place, but they still had to offer sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice continually from the day it was opened until the day it shut its doors. 
because of sin. Good news is, church, Jesus wipes away all of our sin. Jesus gives us a new chance at life again. That if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old life, that sin-filled person is gone. A new life has come. We celebrate Jesus. So when you read through this passage, and we continue to read through 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and we jump into Chronicles tomorrow, you'll see over and over again the sacrifice of blood, the sacrifice of blood. Be thankful. We don't have to do that anymore. That God paid the price once and for all through his son. So today, just take a moment. Take a couple moments and just give God glory. Tell him thank you for giving you a way back to life, for giving you a chance to be redeemed, for giving you an opportunity to not have to be sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing the blood of animals that he paid the price for your freedom. Until we see each other tomorrow, church, you were sent.